Glad is a, a way of helping clinicians to deliver treatment in clinical care uh, that is based on patient education and uh, exercise therapy that can be referred to uh, by general practitioners, uh, orthopedic surgeons, or there is also self-referral. And the reason why uh, Sora and I embarked on this journey to put science into action was that for several years, we had been in discussions with healthcare authorities uh, about implementing treatment guidelines for osteoarthritis in Denmark. And this is what we felt like because the evidence was there and it was recommended in the clinical guidelines. But there were so many barriers and they were related to, to politics, organization and financial incentives. So although the evidence is there, it's not at all sure that it will be implemented in clinical care. There are many other barriers. And that's why we decided to do it ourselves, to try to bridge the gap from uh, clinical guidelines to how to deliver it into clinical practice. And since both Sora and I are clinicians and not uh, implementation researchers or administrators, we have used a bottom-up approach largely for GLAD. So that means that we started small, we um, teamed up with clinicians, we engaged patients to get this thing rolling and, and to uh, change things uh, in clinical practice. And if you wanna read more about the more pragmatic type of implementation model we have used, you can do so um, in a paper by Inge Holm and um, co-authored by Mariana Riesbe, myself and Soren Sko that was published last year in Journal of Orthopedics and Sports Physical Therapy. So GLAD is a success in Denmark. And as of April this year, we had trained more than 1200 physiotherapists mostly physiotherapists, but really clinicians uh, in delivering the GLAD program. And they were working in 429 active clinics. And by April, we had enrolled more than 40,000 patients into the GLAD registry. And Soren will talk a lot more about what you can do with data from the GLAD registry. But because of the success in Denmark, we got requests from other countries where they also wanted to uh, to implement GLAD. So now GLAD is actually available across four different continents. So it started in Denmark nearly eight years ago in 2013. And two years later, we got a, or probably one year later, we got a request from Canada by a fellow researcher, Professor Eileen Davies from Toronto, who was interested in doing the same thing in Canada. So we decided to collaborate. And she and Rona McLassen started GLAD Canada. And um, the year thereafter, Australia came on board and that was Professor Kate Crossley from La Trobe University with her team who wanted to start GLAD Australia. And then it moved on and on and on. So now GLAD is available in seven different countries and we have the capacity to uh, onboard about one country every year. So GLAD, GLAD is a not-for-profit initiative and it is owned by a university and it has been researchers in different countries who have connected to collaborate on implementing this program into clinical care. So the reason why GLAD is trademarked, that has nothing to do with financial interest. It, it only has to do with the fact that we want to protect the quality and the integrity of the program. Over the years, we've also done some pilot projects in different countries and we have learned a lot. Everything from in Nigeria, uh, where uh, the Danish uh, PT student who went there had to start by installing air conditioning and bu building an exercise facility before she could uh, start piloting GLAD in Nigeria. So just to share a little bit more data about the two first countries that joined GLAD. So this is GLAD Canada. And as you can see, 
GLAD is available these days across Canada. So they have trained in more than 700 clinicians and they are active in more than 200 clinics and they have enrolled, or in April, they had enrolled 3,560 patients. And it looks about the same way in Australia. GLAD is available in all the, all the major sites. You know, there is a lot of desert in Australia. That's the middle there. Um, and they have uh, enrolled or had in April enrolled 2,300 patients. So as I said, there are more countries and there are actually seven countries uh, working together in the GLAD international network. And that is an organization where we support each other and we share the different experiences that we have with implementing uh, an evidence-based patient education and exercise therapy program across the globe. And it has been really, really interesting because although we think there are major differences, maybe that relates to culture, the healthcare system in these different countries, we actually realize that the barriers that we encounter are very similar. And we have really learned a lot and been very stimulated and um, by what the solutions that other people have found. So this is a great um, collaborative effort. And if any one of you is interested more in GLAD and what is required to become uh, or to bring GLAD to a new country, you can read more about that on the GLAD International uh, webpage. But as I said, GLAD is it's a two-day course that we give to clinicians. The clinicians go home to their own clinics or their own community or their own hospital where they deliver the treatment, which is patient education and supervised neuromuscular exercise. And, and this program can be adapted. It should be adapted to fit the person, but it is more of a framework, how we work and how we deliver it, but it's always tailored to the individual patient. But the third part of GLAD, which is mandatory, is data collection. And with this data, we can start uh, uh, responding to or, or asking new questions that we have not been able to answer before because there has been a paucity of, of, of data from primary care patients, from real patients treated in real life uh, primary care, mostly in physiotherapy practice, but it could also be other clinicians who have taken the GLAD course. So I will end on this note uh, by introducing data collection and I will hand over to Soren. Thank you, Eva, and thank you, Lee, for the very nice introduction. And of course, thank you to both uh, Jason and to Hina for inviting us to present on GLAD here at this, uh, uh, although not Florida, as you said, to Hina, I think still it's a great venue um, and happy to see so many people here. Um, I guess that we could work a bit or I could work a bit on the title uh, as compared to the nice titles that you have put out. But I will now present on the research from GLAD with some of the selected results. Um, and hopefully in the end, we'll have a lot of time for questions from anyone who wanna ask anything. So based on what Eva said, there are a lot of countries out there who have already started the GLAD program. There are so far, however, four different uh, GLAD international partners who have published in their annual reports. And you can, of course, look them up by searching on Google for them for more specific results from each of the individual countries. I would now like to start with the first research question that we have asked just recently. That is, how does results compare between countries? For this particular analysis, we used the data from Denmark, Canada, and Australia, as these were the countries who had uh, sufficient available data to do uh, the analysis. As you'll see here for pain intensity, the initial baseline pain intensity on a zero to 10 NRS scale was between 4.2 to 5.1. 
and the improvements after the GLAD treatment was uh, between 1.2 and 1.4, with some differences between countries which were not clinically relevant. Of course, we did not include any control group for this analysis, so we do not know how they would have improved without the GLAD program. But interestingly, the results so show fairly similar results across countries. So we also looked at function, the 40 meter fast past walk test. And at this test, it actually seems that people with osteoarthritis uh, in Canada walk uh, faster than people from uh, Denmark and Australia, although not clinically relevant faster at the baseline. And as you'll see, the improvements are actually largest in the Australian group as compared to the Danish and Canadian group of patients with osteoarthritis. Um, also, I would not will not present it here, but the results are similar for the 30 second chair stand tests and also for knee and hip related quality of life measured by the Coos and Who's. We actually also looked into whether there were some factors that could explain the differences, but there were none that had a significant impact on, on the change score. So the change score was only around 5% of the variance uh, explained. Another question that we asked uh, was related to the classification criteria for osteoarthritis, uh, because most of them have been developed for secondary care or for people with more severe osteoarthritis. And we asked the question, could these classification criteria from the ULAR, the ACR, and NICE be used to identify patients treated for osteoarthritis in primary care? For this purpose, we only used the Danish data from around 13,000 uh, people with knee osteoarthritis participating in the GLAD program. Uh, first of all, we looked at how many patients in GLAD would have the typical symptoms, uh, clinical finding and risk factors associated with osteoarthritis. And as you'll see that uh, most had had uh, usage related pain and functional limitations uh, while uh, clinical findings such as crepitus, restricted movement, and bony enlargement were, were less um, common in the population. You also some, see some of the common risk factors listed on the, the right side, uh, which uh, are, had different distribution in this uh, population. Then going into the specific uh, classification criteria, we see that the ULA criteria classified approximately 50% as having osteoarthritis, the ACR similar, while the NICE identified nine out of 10 patients treated for osteoarthritis in primary care. The results were fairly similar if we uh, included only those who had self-reported uh, osteoarthritis on x-ray. What is also important to, to mention is that 10% was actually uh, classified as having osteoarthritis uh, in none of them. So at least based on our findings, this indicates that the NICE criteria, which you can see here in the bottom of the screen, um, is um, the, the set of criteria that is uh, most appropriate to use or uh, identify individuals, treat us for NEOA in primary care. You would probably also appreciate that they uh, are op also the most uh, open criteria as compared to the ACR and EULA. But given that we want to identify people early in clinical practice and give them treatment before x-ray findings are present, uh, this is at least one uh, approach to, to identify people in primary care with knee osteoarthritis. If you want to read more, James Young, who is also from our institution, has actually done a similar study on people with hip osteoarthritis. And this was published in Osteoarthritis and Cartilage Open earlier this year. So you could look it up. Another question that uh, we recently asked is uh, related to the cost effectiveness of the GLAD program. This was an analysis that's, that was done by Dorte Grønne, who is uh, the database manager actually from, from GLAD. Um, she wanted to evaluate, <clears throat> sorry, the one year cost effectiveness of the GLAD program. And she used the patient level data from GLAD and then linked it to uh, the registers in Denmark where we have, have available registers 
uh, of high quality with data related to healthcare costs and, and so on. So uh, she conducted a one-year cost agility analysis and evaluated the incremental cost effectiveness ratios according to common conventional thresholds for willingness to pay both in the UK, that is the first one, around 22,800 uh, euros, and the second one from the US, around 44,000 euros per quality. Importantly, this uh, study has uh, not yet been published. It's in a review, so please do not tweet on the results uh, while I share the results on the next slides. So these are the incremental cost effectiveness ratios for the knee in the left side and the hip in the right side. And comparing the euros per quality uh, to the willingness to pay thresholds that I demonstrated or showed you before, you'll see that the knee is well below the willingness to pay threshold and the hip is still below the willingness to, threshold, uh, to pay threshold as well. Then if we looked more specifically on those with high compliance, which was defined as those who participated in at least 10 of the 12 supervised exercise therapy sessions, we see that the uh, uh, ICERs actually improved further um, as compared to the full population. So the, the conclusion based on the cost, cost effectiveness analysis would be that the GLAD is cost effective as at one year in both knee and hip osteoarthritis. And actually a recent analysis by Elena Ackerman uh, and other uh, collaborators actually showed that only one out of 12 recipients of a program similar to, similar to GLAD, that only one of them would actually need to avoid surgery for it to be cost effective. So this, to me at least, highlight that exercise and education has the potential to also be cost effective. The last uh, publication that I would like to present for you today is uh, related to the analgesics use uh, before and after GLAD. Again, we don't have a control group, but this at least demonstrates the usage of analgesics before and after the program. This was published by our colleague Jonas Thorland, who is a professor here at the university. And it was published in PGSM earlier this year. And I'll show a couple of slides from, from his uh, publication now. So first of all, we see that a lot of patients actually stop taking painkillers after the, uh, the program. We see that uh, three out of 10 stop taking painkillers, which was mainly driven by a large reduction in the number of NSAID users, which you'll see here from the, the table in the, in the third line. Actually, something that was very interesting as well was that a lot, uh, or at least a high percentage, stopped taking opioids after the program. Uh, around one out of three taking opioids before did not take it after the program. And in addition to uh, several people stopping, uh, stop taking painkillers, actually several of them also uh, reduced their intake of what you could call uh, drugs with a higher risk, associated risk. So for example, you see in the, the second line here uh, with where stand opioids, where you can see opioids, you see that 18% start taking NSAIDs after the GLAD program, 14% start taking paracetamols. And then as I said before, a considerable proportion actually stop taking opioids. And you'll see the same below for, for NSAIDs. So that's another um, seemingly positive effect or at least change after the GLAD program. If you want to learn more about uh, the GLAD program, I would encourage you to visit the gladinternational.org webpage. You could also find other published papers about or from uh, GLAD data on the uh, glaid.dk webpage and also learn more about the GLAD back program, which is uh, a sister program uh, really, uh, treating patients with low back pain with a program that is fairly similar to GLAD, of course, with different exercises. So this was uh, my final slide. And I think now is the time for, for the Q&A. Great. <clears throat> thank you both, Ava and Soren, for wonderful presentations. And also thank you for all the work you've done with GLAD. I mean, this is 
phenomenal, the international reach and how things are uh, just taking off in, across all of the continents that you've mentioned. We've got questions coming in. And before we jump to the questions, I want to take uh, the moderator's prerogative and ask a first question where if the two of you would comment on GLAD during COVID and how many of the countries have pivoted to virtual and what types of things you're seeing. Sure, Eva. I'm not sure. Uh, thanks, Lee. I'm not sure who, how we are dividing the questions, Eva, but I think I could perhaps start off with, with some of uh, this related to COVID that you could add in. Uh, sure, it has been a challenge um, across the different countries. Um, one of the things that both Canada and Australia have been working on for a long time is e-based delivery of the GLAD program. And we have even here in the, the small country of Denmark uh, tried the uh, the approach of delivering GLAD online, and I'm sure the results from from these initiatives will will soon be available. But just looking at the numbers of the physical presence in the GLAD program in Denmark, we see a significant drop, or have seen a significant drop in the number of people entering the GLAD program. And and we know also from more qualitative feedback from patients, as I'm sure you have heard the same, that this is a a very big disturbance and, and has significant impact on both their quality of life and of course their their function. So so it has a has had a significant impact. I don't know if you Eva wanna chip in. No, I think that we have benefited a lot from having several countries and a close collaboration on board because just as Soren said, there was we, we already have a telehealth subgroup in GLAD or in the GLAD International Project. So we could actually draw a lot of experience from that and, and share it with the other countries. Uh, and that has certainly been uh, beneficial. We never thought that we would need uh, to deliver online in, in Denmark, which is a very, very small country compared to, to Canada and, and Australia. But during these very challenging times, we certainly have had that uh, possibility. But I would say that we have recruited, I think, um, I think the recruitment rate has dropped some 30 or 40% uh, during this year so far. And I, I think it is actually much less than I feared uh, when this whole thing started. Okay, I will start in on the questions. And um, the first one is, uh, what institutions are, le or institution is, or, leading the effort to bring GLAD to the U.S. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there is a, a, an answer to that question because there is no institution leading that um, initiative. Yes, and um, no, not yet. And I, I will chime in to say that uh, we do know that there's interest in the U.S., that you've had people who are interested and that uh, the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance has had some discussions with you as well as with um, GLAD Canada, but as we all know, the in, um, reimbursement systems are so different. And so we're looking to see how feasible things would be and if we could possibly be a partner in bringing that, but everything is very preliminary at the moment. Uh, how do you ascertain the fidelity of the physical therapy training and care delivery ac across countries given different health system context and incentives? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I would like to say that when Sword and I started this thing, uh, we were not very um, aware of the absolute uh, requirement or need for quality uh, in, uh, quality improvement and, qual and, and checking the quality all the time. But we have certainly learned that it's all about the quality. And uh, we have regular meetings where we, uh, we have regular subgroups on content, on outcomes and on telehealth, as I said, to make sure that we align between the different uh, countries. But the, of course, there are also differences between the countries that have to be taken into account. So, so if you take the GLAD course in Denmark, uh, you'll learn about the Danish healthcare system 
and then you're not then you cannot uh, deliver the glad in australia for example which with a total different um uh, healthcare system. So you would have to retake the course in Australia because you have to learn about the Australian healthcare system and how this would fit there. So do you, just to expand that a little bit, you work specifically with each country uh, and have a designated person in the country who's really developing all of the aspects about the healthcare system of that country? Mm, well, uh, it's, it's a... Uh, each country own their own GLAD concept, so to say. So uh, they work locally to develop those aspects. So, so what are very similar is the content. What is delivered across the countries? I guess just to chip in with the fidelity locally in each, each uh, country, uh, there has been development in the, the GLAD International Group checklist that can be used for individual clinics or GLAD units uh, for fidelity because fidelity is of course important and even I guess more important in a project that is spread across several countries and a lot of units with a lot of different therapists and exercise physiologists. That's uh, the next one sort of leads into, again, this discussion about other countries. What are the prerequisites to start the GLAD program in a new country? So we actually have developed something called 11 steps about what is required. And it would take too long time here to go into that. So I actually have to refer to the GLAD International website if you are more interested. But I would say that in all countries this far, it has required collaboration of a university to manage the, um, the electronic data collection and the registry and the ethics applications and, and all those aspects. Right. Um, did comment, great talks. And the question was, does BMI change after the GLAD intervention in those who are overweight or obese? Sora, do you know that? Yeah, I could start by talking a bit around it because we have actually not investigated yet. Uh, I could say that, that, as you're probably aware, that exercise in itself is not a good way to lose weight. Uh, what we see in the GLAD program, which is mostly education and uh, exercise, is that patients across BMIs do not change their mean BMIs, but we have actually not yet looked into the overweight or obese people so so if you want to look into that you could of course reach out to us and we could discuss it great uh and this is a little bit, a bit similar to that are there any do you have any idea about subgroups of patients that benefit more from glad and if so are these similar between countries that's a really good question. And I actually had a PhD student, Linda Baumbach, who um, uh, used machine learning and um, uh, to try to figure out if we could predict who would have a better or a worse outcome. And the whole idea was that we wanted to build some kind of calculator for patients or for physicians where they could enter some baseline data from their patients or from yourself, and you could actually predict what the outcome would be. And I had great faith in this project because we had data from so many patients and we had actually 51 different um, predictor variables that we tested. But much, much to our surprise, we found that even if we entered all these predictors into the model, uh, we could not predict a result that was clinically relevant better than the group average. And this was recently published in osteoarthritis and cartilage. So our conclusion was that clinicians can confidently uh, share the group mean improvements with our patients uh, to estimate what they can um, what they can get out of take, participating in the program and and this to me was uh, 
a big, big surprise because there has been such efforts before, but I have always thought that there was two, two small cohorts, but this cohort is for sure large enough and we could still not find anything. It's interesting. Um, okay, we have just a few other questions. Uh, one, I'll just note to everyone that you have uh, put the website for GLAD um, into the chat box if for people who are interested in it. And then there's a question of, is there a provision to substitute the 40 meter walk test with a shorter distance test to adapt for clinics with smaller space avail availability? Yeah, perhaps I should have been a more bit more specific. It's actually four times 10 meters, which at least in Denmark is something that most clinics would have available. So the 10 meter plus the ability to turn around the cone. So, so in GLAD at least we have set to, in GLAD Denmark, we have set to do the, the few people or few clinics that did not have a 10 to 12 meter hallway that they should of course then conduct a eight to five, eight times five meter um, mm -hmm. walking test, but that they, they shouldn't register in the, the register because it's different from the four times 10, which is the recommended ORC test. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, what is the level of adherence to the program and how long have your subjects been participating in the program? I'm not sure if they're meaning how long do they do things afterwards or? So, so in Denmark, uh, eight out of 10 patients participate in 10 or more supervised sessions. And the program runs for six weeks, so it's 12 sessions. That is the full program. And we actually don't know to the extent that they continue afterwards, but we do a follow-up at one year. And what is really interesting with the GLAD is that the results we see immediately after the program are actually sustained at one year. So we can see that there is a sustained pain relief they still have their, they still walk faster and their quality of life has improved even more. And we can also see that there are fewer sick leaves uh, during the year after GLAD compared to the year prior to GLAD. That's great. And does Laura, GLAD do you have anything to add there? I think you presented it as I would have presented it. The only <laughs> thing, thing to add is that we have the two educational sessions and it's actually eight out of 10 also who participate in both of them. And, and I think with this experience that we have now, I, I would not do an exercise study ever without or, or implementing an exercise intervention without the uh, patient education part, because that is uh, crucial for adherence and for the patient's understanding uh, of available treatments and for their motivation. That sort of uh, takes us back to the question in uh, Dan White's talk about should you have multiple components in interventions and behavioral interventions. <clears throat> Uh, I think we have time for a few more questions. I think we go to 205. Uh, one is, does GLAD adhere with a biopsychosocial approach? Yes. <laughs> the short answer. Yes. I also would like to say that there are researchers who have um, um, put a lot of energy into this and a lot of research into this. And, and we have, of course, uh, adapted uh, the results from that. And one last question here was, have you delivered the program in community-based settings such as senior centers or gyms? If so, how was the experience? Do you want to go, Sora? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we have not uh, delivered in gyms outside a physiotherapy gym. We have uh, in Denmark uh, a system where you could either go to the municipalities, what you could call this related or somewhat the same as senior centers, uh, or a private fisio. And uh, the challenges, at least from a Danish 
uh, in the Danish context is that in private practice, you know that the patient would pay themselves, while in the municipalities, it's uh, something that the local municipality governance should uh, pay for. And there is some uh, problems in uh, ensuring that all people, no matter their economic background, is actually able to participate since the, the implementation in the municipalities is a bit more tricky, but the results are fairly, fairly similar of them. I would say that in Canada, they have some experience from uh, delivering in community settings. And as far as I know, uh, they have had good experience with that, but I will have to, to refer to um, GLAD Canada for more information on that. All right. Well, thank you both so much for wonderful talks and the wonderful work you've, you're doing now and have been doing for so long. I'm going to turn us back over. You can actually see there is a response from Marie Westby, uh, uh, oh. who is oh, trained yeah. in Canada. Yes. Yes, she says, yes, we have a program in British Columbia happening in a local recreation center, but offered by GLAD trained physical therapist. Thank you, Marie. Thanks, Marie, for answering that question. Um, and many thank yous are coming in as well. So.